Hey everybody, I'm down here in North Carolina with my friend Chris. Chris actually helped me out uh, years ago uh, with some of the details on my electrical that I had done wrong. And ever since then, we've been friends, and this is the first time we've gotten to meet in person. Thanks for having me down here, Chris. Yeah, Dave, it's really good to have you, man. It's, uh, you know, it's always nice to uh, be able to shake your hand in person versus just talk to you on the phone. Well, we are gonna go through his off-grid property and I'm gonna let Chris do all the talking because it's his house and it's his story. So here we go. So what we have here is uh, about 10 acres off grid uh, here in central North Carolina. We've built a uh, little shed behind us. It's all off grid with solar power. The thought here is that we would build a house and it's gonna take some time because we're doing as much DIY as we can. The shed currently has a mini split heat pump on it that's run off the inverter and the batteries that's charged by solar. So it's completely climate controlled uh, and all solar power. There's no utility power on the property currently. Uh, the inverter I'm using is a Schneider 6848. It's the XW Pro version. Uh, the batteries we're using are the batteries from a BMW car. We got them from a uh, battery hookup and they were from a, a they're, they're scrap from automobiles. The charge controller is the Schneider 60 amp version. I'm not running the 600 volt, but the 150 volt. So the array here is about 1500 watts. Uh, it's done in two strings of panels. So it's not really high voltage, it's not really high current. And that is actually enough to uh, run that heat pump during the summer all, all the time, 24 seven. The cabling coming over is 10 gauge, which is overkill for even the amount of amps that are gonna come over. Uh, and since it's only two, pan two sets of panels, I don't even need a combiner box. So I'm just using the connectors that connect the two strings of MC4s together before it goes onto the cable that comes over here. So mostly we use the property for recreation. Uh, we've got a camping set up over here with a fire pit. We've got the a little uh, shed behind us. We come out here and just have a lot of fun. And I think we've had uh, maybe 15 or so people out here at one time, just out running around, just enjoying you know, nature. So the XW Plus is at my house. I've had it now for about five years. And in the five years, it has run continuously in that time. I've only had to turn it off twice that I can remember. And both times was for things I needed to do for like maintenance on the batteries or changing out a um, circuit breaker. That's it. It has run continuously for five years. No overloads, no faults, nothing. I, I can't argue with that, you know. It's, it's been very reliable in, the, in those five years. Starting over today, would I still buy the Schneider versus buying newer inverters that say have charge controllers built in and more functionality and those kind of things? The simple answer is no. I would not buy one of those inverters. And it's not that I'm you know, hating on them or anything, is I just have a slightly different outlook on how these systems should be put together. So I work in industry and we use a lot of Schneider equipment in industry, whether it's variable speed drives or even switch gear, some really heavy duty electrical stuff. And you know, it's reliable, it's dependable, it's in heavy duty. So having it at home actually gives me some confidence in its uh, ability just to keep working. And the last five years have proven that th they just work. The other reason why I would not go with some of the newer inverters that have all these extra features built in is if say if lightning takes out my array and, and hits my charge controller, I'm down a charge controller. My, my house otherwise still works. One of the other things we do out here is uh, I like to buy uh, generators and other military equipment that I kind of tinker on and, and resell sometimes. I really like to see people using this great equipment. So I really love the military equipment um, because one, it's over-engineered because of the duty that it's going to be subjected to. And it's built like a tank. You know, you know, I know that's kind of a kind of a funny pun or whatever you want to think about it or um, but yeah, it really is. That stuff is built to where if you just treat it with a reasonable amount of respect and some maintenance, uh, like the generators, they'll outlive me. The, the military generators can be more expensive. And if you are going to compare it to like a civilian generator, if you're going to try to do a more apples to apples comparison, you would look at maybe a hardy diesel or maybe even one of the Kubotas from a capacity and, and durability standpoint, they still are not more durable than these. And when you look at them, a lot of them have less instrumentation, less configurability. 
And I can say a lot of the parts in these generators are very easy to find. The relays are pretty much standard. So this generator here, the model number is the MEP802. It's five kilowatt, it's a military unit. And so that five kilowatt is a continuous rating. It will put out five kilowatts for hours and hours, 24 seven, for as long as you run it. It'll do five kilowatts without overheating, without causing any undue stress on the system. These units are much different than what you can get like consumer grade equipment from. You can adjust the voltage, you can adjust the phase. It has a lot more instrumentation to see oil pressure, coolant temperature, power output, voltage output. Uh, and it'll do three phase and single phase power, which is kind of unusual in a, in a generator as small as this. Um, but that is uh, a lot of the cool features about these things. The fuel tank on this unit is five gallons. Uh, at full load, it's rated for just under half a gallon an hour. So that gives you, you know, a full shift of operation without having to refill. It also has an auxiliary fuel pump, so you can connect it to a large fuel tank and this unit will just run as long as you have fuel. So the rated capacity of the unit is five kilowatts. That's prime. So generally, if you look at a generator, if it's prime rated, it will on average do about 20% over that rating for short periods of time. This one we did load test at 125% uh, uh, overload and it was able to do that, which is about 6,500 watts. So we ran this one at 6,500 watts for a full half hour. Now for controls, this knob here controls our voltage output. This knob here controls which phase of the system we are actually measuring. Um, and then our switches down here have to do with sending power out of the unit, turning the panel lights on and off. This is a battle short switch, which is basically emergency override. So our alarm enunciator over here, if any of these alarms come on, it'll shut the unit down unless you flip the switch up. If you flip the switch up, it ignores every alarm except for low fuel. That's the only alarm it will not ignore. So it'll run until it burns itself up if you flip the switch up. And the other switch here is our master switch and it is what starts and stops the unit. So with our frequency meter here, if you find out that your adjustment is not really where you want it set, you actually have a frequency adjust meter here. So you would turn this knob to get your frequency set exactly where you want. Generally you want it set so that when the unit is fully loaded, you're around 60 Hertz. What's gonna happen when you unload the unit is it'll speed up slightly up to about 61 or so Hertz. Yeah, so the other end of this knob is actually connected to the fuel injection system on the side of the engine. So that's part of the governor. So when you're doing this, you're actually adjusting the governor setting on the engine. So all the generators for the military have this 24 volt NATO plug on them. These are hard to find. And since I wanted to use this cord for other things, I had it built with some Anderson connectors, which also allow me to put on a big set of uh, clamps so I can just clamp it directly to the battery. Gives me a lot of uh, flexibility and uh, just doesn't limit me to using this one style connector. So what we have here, this is a uh, load bank that can do 33 kilowatts of load uh, resistive. And what's really nice about it, is if we look under the panel right here, we can pretty much just set our loads to whatever we want in three kilowatt in increments. And this bottom one in here is a three kilowatt variable. So I can put basically any load on it I want between zero and 33 kilowatts, which makes it great because I can fine tune the load to really challenge the generator regardless of what size it is. So on this side, what we're looking at is some safeties over here, some control transformers, and then over here is the variax which control the amount of power that goes to the low power, the one three kilowatt load. And then if you look kind of back into the unit, you can see the fins that are on the resistive heating elements that actually create the load. Um, and then if we look on the other side, you can see the fans from where uh, the heat is drawn away from those heating elements. And this unit will test either single phase or three phase loads. So you can connect it either way. Off-grid properties often choose to go with a propane tank. Uh, why'd you choose not to go that way? Well, here propane tends to be expensive. Uh, and also, you're at the whim of the company delivering it. You know, I can't, I can't go get a thousand gallons of propane and bring it over here myself. I can go get several hundred gallons of diesel fuel, uh, but not propane. So the, the whole decision between diesel versus propane versus gasoline really comes down to uh, availability, cost. And if we were to look at, say, propane as an example, 
And having a large propane tank in the ground here would be an awesome thing. And also propane doesn't really deteriorate carburetors or what have you. So from a storage standpoint, it's a very stable fuel over a long period of time, which goes into plus categories. The negative is cost. The long-term plan here for power is I purchased some enclosures, which are also military sourced, that will end up holding the batteries and the inverter systems. So I'm gonna have one of these shelters, which they're, they're about eight feet wide and they're about 12 feet long. They're made out of aluminum with insulation and everything, so they're um, well suited for this purpose. One of these will end up being my powerhouse. So I'll have both inverters, all the batteries, uh, and the main power switch gear all in this one location, along with the generators. So there'll be a concrete pad poured, the building will go on it, the generators will go on it, and everything will get wired together so that it's seamless. Generators will come on as needed, batteries charged from the sun, batteries charged from the generator, and I'll even have grid power available in, if I need it. So as you can probably see, we're, we're sitting here in the woods. So obviously solar doesn't work well in the shade. Well, one of the benefits of having a 10 acre lot and one of the reasons why I wanted a 10 acre lot is the plan is to clear out a couple acres, which will give me more than enough space to have a house, a garden, and enough room to have about a 14 kilowatt solar array and to have at least four, five. my goal is to have uh, at least five solid sun hours on the panels per day. And my hope is that that's going to give me enough power to, you know, make it through the night each night. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm oversizing the array. I really don't need 14 kilowatts, but I want to be able to charge the batteries up in five hours. So when, when we start looking at our power needs and everything, you know, if you design your house with off-grid in mind, it allows you to make some decisions that can make your battery bank last for days and days and days. If we look at an example for, say, heating, cooling, uh, I'm going to try to do zones with probably using mini split type heat pumps where I can, uh, in, in times when uh, we need to be on, like, say, limited power, I can heat or cool only a smaller portion of the house and really extend the amount of time that the batteries might last. And so my goal is to have at least 72 hours of power in the batteries with no external energy, whether it be from the sun or generator. One of the things that I intend to do in my house is I'm gonna have three power sources in the house. So one is gonna be inverter power solar. So the, the AC distribution is gonna come from my uh, powerhouse and it will switch between generator utility or inverter power, depending on what's available. But also, I'm also sending DC power to my house. I'm gonna take the 48 volts from my battery bank and send it to the house as well. And you might ask, well, why would I ever wanna send 48 volts DC to my house? Well, why would you ever wanna send 48 volts DC to your house? You know, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> the, the reason why I wanna send 48 volts over is all my lighting is gonna be DC. I like the idea of having multiple power sources because as, as you say, if the generator goes down, if the inverter goes down, then I don't have any lights in my house. If I have DC lighting, as long as I have battery power, and the batteries are probably one of the most reliable parts of the entire system as far as it, are they gonna fail. The, the batteries, unless they catch on fire, aren't generally gonna fail like gone. They're gonna lose capacity, they're gonna lose voltage, you, you get some warning about that. Uh, an inverter or a charge controller or whatever, they can, they can literally blow up and be done in a second. Now, thankfully with this equipment, the probability of that is fairly low, but it could still happen. Where um, if I run the DC power, I can run DC lighting in the house and have a situation where the probability of failure is lower. Now, Obviously, if I run 48 volts into the house, I need to get it down to whatever my lighting voltage is, which may be 12 or 24 volts, more than likely 24 volts. So any converters I have in that chain become susceptible to failure. That becomes my single point of failure. But the reality is those buck converters are super cheap. 
So yeah, David, it was really good to have you down here to see the property and kind of see my little uh, janky setup down here. It's been a lot of fun to put together over the years and it, it's good to have uh, people in the community that we can kind of share ideas with on renewable energy. Well, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, appreciate it.